It's now my pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker, Congresswoman Shelley Pingree. Uh, she'll be uh, keynoting our legislating change in, in agriculture panel. Uh, Congresswoman Pingree is a farmer, an advocate, a businesswoman, a parent, and someone who is inspiring the next generation of food leaders. She is also a crusader in the fight against food loss and food waste, and recently introduced H.R. 4184, the Food Recovery Act. This is landmark legislation which is aimed at reducing food waste on farms and grocery stores, in schools and other institutions, at restaurants, and by consumers. Congresswoman Pingree, I want to thank you for your work, your commitment to the country's farmers, and for taking on this fight to reduce food waste in the United States. Following uh, the Congresswoman's remarks, Devin Henry from The Hill will be moderating our panel. Please join me in welcoming Congresswoman Pingree to the stage. Well, thank you very much, Danielle. Thank you to everybody in the room for being here today. And thank you for Food Tank for putting on such a wonderful conference. I'm sorry that that pesky Congress has gotten in the way, and I haven't been able to spend more time here listening to the other panelists. And I may have to rush out for votes this morning. But I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of this panel of people talking about some of the issues that we deal with on the Hill and how to move forward on some of the challenges we have politically. Um, it was great uh, both to see the diversity of panels that have been part of this, talking about a whole range of issues, as all of you know who have been here, but also the range of speakers, from advocates to experts to scientists. I was pleased to see Secretary Vilsack here yesterday. You know, there was a time when you couldn't get a Secretary of Agriculture uh, to talk to a room full of people with concerns like this. If you think back to Earl Butts in the early 60s when we said, get big or get out, and that was what agriculture was those days. Uh, it's wonderful to see this change. And last night at the dinner, they had Chairman Conway, the chair of the Agriculture Committee, and again, he opened his remarks by saying, you know, I don't always speak to room full of people uh, with these interests, but I'm really happy to be here and bring us all together. And uh, agriculture is one of those issues that can be very bipartisan, and I think we can find solutions uh, to move forward on many of these issues, and we're thrilled that the Agriculture Committee is going to have a hearing on our food waste bill in May, and that's, uh, to me, a sign of progress, having worked on these issues for almost 40 years of my life. Um, I just want to start with a little survey. I'm going to talk a little bit about food waste today. Um, raise your hand if you've ever gotten into an argument with someone about whether or not you should throw away some food because the date on the label has passed. Pretty much universal. Um, I think it happens in every household in America, and it may be the biggest cause of divorce in America, for all I know. Uh, every time some food gets thrown away just because the date has passed, frankly, that food is just wasted. And food waste is a huge problem in America. About 40% of all the food produced in the United States goes to waste. That is a serious cost for our society. That's $160 billion a year in uneaten food. Works out to be about $125 a month for a family of four. And it's bad for the environment. Food is the single largest source of food waste in municipal landfills. When it breaks down, it produces methane gas. That's a greenhouse gas that's 21 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So if you're worried about climate change and you're worried about uh, the pollution produced by agriculture, this is a big part of it. The amount of food waste in this country is steadily increasing, but we see this now as an opportunity. While all this food is being wasted, 50 million Americans, as we know, are food insecure. If we, could stop by, if we could stop throwing away healthy, quality food, we could reduce food waste, and we could reduce food waste by about 15%. We could cut that number of food insecure people in about half. So I've introduced a bill this year called the Food Recovery Act. It includes about two dozen proposals that tackle wasted food at four levels. At the consumer level, in grocery stores and restaurants, in schools and other institutions, and on the farm. So let me just talk about a few of the provisions in that bill. Excuse me, I'm just recovering from a cold. Um, one, we would um, start with stores and restaurants. One of the things um, to do is to expand a tax deduction that restaurants and stores get to donate food to organizations that serve 
healthy family, and also to expand liability protection for stores that donate food, so they don't need to be afraid of being sued over food that they donate. We encounter that now and then where institutions will say, well, I'm a little worried, uh, particularly because of these expiration date, could I get myself in trouble if I do this? So we want to expand that liability protection and also have a tax deduction so restaurants and stores feel the incentive to do this. For farmers, one of the things that we're doing is talking about the food that often ends up in the field because it's ugly or it can't be sold at the market. So our bill will expand the tax deduction for farmers who donate food to soup kitchens and, and food pantries. And we also want to invest in programs that help farmers build on-farm digesters, which to turn food waste into energy. We're seeing some models of that around the country. One of the big dairy farms in Maine now has an anaerobic digester. Um, and that means that they can produce um, electricity, they can convert the uh, waste into a kind of fertilizer, and they also accept food waste to go along with the farm manure. So it's a win-win on, on all sides. For schools and other institutions, um, we've seen where schools can often be our front line of really bringing about change. If you think about um, you know, recycling, a lot of times people were reluctant to start re recycling, but when their fourth graders came home from school and said, wait a minute, why are we throwing the bottles in the trash with the rest of the garbage? You know, Parents woke up and said, maybe this is something we should do about it. So we're very interested in that. We've seen it with school gardens, with the expansion of school gardens. You know, Kids, sometimes if they only have a tiny little plot, of carrots, they still go into the cafeteria and say, whoa, we grew that carrot, or we grew that kale. And you can start changing kids' eating habits with healthy food. So one of the things we want to do is get schools involved in this and uh, revise some of the, the uh, provisions in the National School Lunch Program in their procurement use to encourage the purchase of small or non-standard produce. You know, sometimes when a piece of produce can't make it to grade A, it's strictly cosmetic. It might be a little too small. It might be a little misshapen. Well, a small apple is just perfect for a kid's school lunch. Why don't we redirect some of that food that might be slightly misshapen or a different size to the school lunch programs? But one of the things that we think would be somewhat of an easy fix, although nothing, as you know, is easy in Congress, um, but that's the way to change the way those labels look that you all argue about when you're at home or at work. According to a recent study, reforming date labeling is one of the most cost-effective things we could do to reduce food waste. It's surprising to people, but there's actually no federal laws regarding expiration dates except for laws on baby formula. So manufacturers can choose whatever they want for the dates that they put on food, and it can lead to consumers and retailers throwing out perfectly good food. People are always surprised when I tell them that because I think with you know, all the food safety standards and other things in our country, we assume that when you pick up a label, it must have some basis in science or some basis in meaning. Now, it may mean that the manufacturer thinks, well, it will be best if you eat it by this particular time, but it doesn't mean that it's not perfectly good food. A few examples. You know, honey can last a long time. Archaeologists have found honey that's thousands of years old, and it's still good. But the date on a bottle of honey you buy today might tell you you have to use it up in a few months. And there's really no reason for that. You know, maybe it'll get crystallized and you have to heat it up. But frankly, it's not going to hurt you. We've talked to food scientists who say they've tested undamaged cans of soup that are still good for over 40 years. But soup manufacturers put a date that usually just says two years into the future. So then you end up throwing away the can, the soup, everything else, um, and you wasted the food. So very soon, um, I'm about to introduce a bill with Senator Dick Blumenthal of Connecticut. We're going to introduce a bill to create a simple, uniform date labeling system. Right now, as you know, there are too many of these labels. Sometimes they say best buy. Sometimes they say use buy, sell buy, expires on. And none of those have any particular meaning to the consumer, and most of them just confuse the rest of us. There's a hodgepodge of state laws, and in 20 states, it's actually illegal to donate food past the date on the label. So think of that. In 20 states, we're throwing away enormous amounts of foods because you're not allowed um, to give it away or to do something else with it. So we think our bill will simplify this mess. Uh, food will be divided into two categories, food that is actually unsafe to eat if it's too old, um, food that the FDA and the USDA determine would be dangerous as it gets older, and that would have an actual label that says expires on. So you would understand the clear meaning. But most food that you buy every day would just have the label best if used by. And our, our bill will also allow for the donation of foods after this quality date. So it will make it clear to people that it's perfectly fine to give away food. It's just best if you eat it by then. But 
who of us haven't woken up in the night and eaten a bag of stale crackers because there was just nothing else to eat in the house. So, you know, and we've lived to tell about it. Um, most importantly, we hope this bill will require that the FDA educate the public on what these labels mean. Because for most people, we just don't, we don't either know about the labels or we have no idea how much food we're wasting in this country. We need to come down on the side who, of whoever in your household is making the argument that you don't have to throw out the food just because the date on the label has passed. So for those of you on the other side, don't get angry at me about this, but someone else is going to win this fight in your house. As you know, um, and I know there was a wonderful panel on it yesterday, talking about food waste has become very popular, but it's frankly not a new concept. Everybody had a grandmother who said to us, don't waste your food, eat everything on your plate. And that's really all this is. It's not a partisan issue, it's one of those things everyone understands. And honestly, again, most people are horrified to think that we waste so much food in this country, that we're taking it away from people who could um, putting, be putting more food on their table, that we're causing environmental problems, and frankly, we're wasting a tremendous amount of funny, money. And if you see those uh, wonderful new ads that the Ad Council and the NRDC are doing that I think you heard about yesterday, you'll see the, the life of a strawberry, and there it is. A farmer puts a lot of work into it. A lot of farm workers put a lot of work into it. We put resources, energy, we ship it around the country, and then like so many of us, it ends up in the back of our refrigerator, and by the time when we get to what we realize, oh no, I forgot to eat that beautiful box of strawberries. And when you think it all through, um, you know, it, it's just one of those things that we shouldn't have to do. And frankly, it's a much bigger problem than most of us had thought. So it's time to get the conversation going. We're looking forward to having a public hearing on this. We're looking forward to working with all of you and your communities and your organizations and those of you who can help us with this. And it's one of those pieces of legislation which, as you'll hear on the panel, um, things don't always go smoothly. Things are often contentious. We don't agree on everything. And we have some huge battles to face in changing our food and farming system. But I believe this is one of those things that we we can tackle, we can fix, and we can solve the problem. Thank you very much for having me here today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your moderator, Devin Henry, The Hill. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Devin Henry with The Hill. We have a good panel uh, here to talk about some of these uh, issues and how Congress and other policymakers are dealing with them. Um, I wanted to start by asking, and feel free to introduce yourselves when you guys uh, begin, begin speaking here. Um, Congresswoman Pingree just mentioned uh, a bill that she has to deal with sort of changing behavior uh, of, of people around food waste. Beyond this bill, what are you sort of seeing from policymakers in terms of best ways to do this? And anybody who wants to chat can go ahead and do this. Best ways to do what? Best ways to change the behavior around food waste, consumers, uh, producers, everything like that. Well, I'm Kathleen Merrigan, um, and I was the deputy secretary for the first Obama term. And I will say, coming in in 2009, food waste, and I agree with the Congresswoman, it is what our grandmothers said, and it has been an issue that's been around for a long time, but it wasn't part of the public dialogue. And it gives me great optimism that an issue that really has been dormant for so long and building an importance can all of a sudden have this ascendancy. Now that people are talking about it, they're talking about it in college, in university classrooms, we're talking about it in community halls. The legislation that uh, Shelley Pingree has will um, be marvelous if it passes. And I do agree it's a bipartisan issue. So, so for me, it's really interesting how important social media has been, and that's been a big part of Food Tank, is getting the word out about emerging issues. Food waste is now discussed at every important meeting I go to. That wasn't true. That wasn't true even four years ago. So the agenda can change. This bill looks to deal with some big institutions in, in the food industry, in the agriculture industry, from farmers to restaurants to grocery stores. Um, Congresswoman and then the rest of the panel, how do you get these people on your side? How do you get these institutions to sort of um, agree with your vision and then execute it? 
Well, I have to say it's a wonderful experience. As I said, I've, I've worked on these issues for a long time. I was a state legislator before I came to Congress. So food policy has been something I've been watching for really 40 years. And from a time when these were kind of marginalized topics, you know, if you want to discuss organic farming in the 70s, you were kind of a Birkenstock, can't be back to the lander, um, till today when so many of these topics are front and center and there's a huge interest in them. And I think for a lot of institutions, they're very aware of how the consumer perceives how their institution is run. So I've been on the Hill and working on issues like you know GMO labeling, where everything is a fist fight every day, and you're always up against the you know the, all the food processors and groceries and other things. This issue, we've been getting calls since the day we started from everybody from uh, people who are in the refrigeration business to uh, supermarket chains big food processors, to them, it's a big problem too. And certainly retailers, the largest retail chain in our state, um, unrelated to what we're doing, made it their goal uh, to reduce food waste to zero. So they do their best in their grocery store to sell things that are sellable, then to donate to a food pantry, and then they're turning over their food to either composters or anaerobic digesters. So I'm just going to say this is one of those blissful moments when everyone comes to us to be on our side and we get to sit on the same side of the table for a change as opposed to being like, you know, try to move over to my side and agree with me. So mm -hmm. it's been very good, and, mm -hmm. and I think there's broad support because, you know, it's an economic issue, it makes good sense, and... I think we're going to be able to move on it. Yeah. Hi, I'm Deb Atwood. I'm the executive director of Agree. And we have been a platform to have very engaged, diverse dialogue around farm to fork, if you will, from inputs all the way to retail. And food waste came up early on in the discussion. I, in full confession here, Kathleen, to my left, is one of our uh, co-chairs of Agree. Um, but you weren't part of it when we had the discussion around food waste. And what we realized in the international context, food waste is also a very big issue. Right. But we have to focus first in the United States, but internationally we can't let that go. And it's not due to people throwing away their food. It's the, 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 the produce and the, the food can't get from the field actually mm -hmm. even to, to the markets. Right. So there's that component piece of it too that we, we need to remind ourselves and include in our thinking. You know. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name's Allie Berlow. I'm the author of the Food Activist Handbook. And I think with any policy, whether it's a food waste policy or water policy, um, I invoke one of my colleagues' friend, my, one of my colleagues, Noli Taylor, who says, I can only change what I can see. And once you see something like food waste, or uh, equity issues or food chain issues uh, in the food systems, then I think we can see that, we, we can do something about it. And to be able to see it, I think raising the bar in education programs like farm to school programs at a very early age, starting at preschool, so people get good food education at the beginning um, and raising then essentially not only well good food educated children that grow into voters um, who will vary who are going to become very engaged, hopefully, in their food system. So, so I, I always think when you can see it uh, and help educate about it, then you can actually activate change and make crop progress. Let's talk a little bit about that, too, because your bill has, or I believe the new bill coming, has uh, an FDA education component to it. Um, how have we sort of seen uh, public education on this shift over the years. It seems like this is an issue that's getting more attention today than ever before, uh, but more, more work needs to be done on this. So I'll just say that um, if it doesn't pass right away, Congresswoman, rename it the Marriage Preservation Act <laughs> because I have had these battles Reduced with my, divorce. I've had these battles with my husband. So there still is, while it's emerged as a big food issue and people here and watching on live stream are probably aware of the magnitude of this issue, it still isn't in every household in America in the way it needs to be. So that, that's just a little hint. Good, good point. <laughs> and, uh, I'm Claire, Claire DiMatina, the Executive Director of Food Policy Action. And, and to Kathleen's point, I just want to underline the unique moment that we're in that um, Republicans and Democrats are very interested in talking about this issue because they're hearing about it from their constituents. Because all of you are talking about it and it's in the front page of the newspaper and it's on blogs and it's, um, there's you know, documentaries about it, but the, we still need to educate members of Congress, Congresswoman Pingree and um, several others as the exception, but just because there's a desire um, 
to work on these issues, there's, there's a lot of work still to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we need more and louder um, calls for action from, from the public to be able to, to really see over the next 18 months real progress on, on an issue like this ahead of the next bond building. Claire, while we've got you, your, your group has a scorecard uh, for Congress, as many groups do. Can you sort of talk about what you guys focus on when it comes to uh, looking at what Congress is doing and, and who you've seen work well on this, what issues you focused on over, over the past couple years here? Um, so in full disclosure, before I was executive director of Food Policy Action, I worked for Congresswoman Kingery for, for five years. Um, uh, Lucky me. <laughs> um, and what we <coughs> saw through that period of time and, and before was that despite huge shifts in the marketplace and consumers wanting to know more about their food, there was a real lack of education by members of Congress on the changes in the marketplace and, um, and how important is, these issues were to their constituents. And so uh, in 2012, um, through a collaboration with Ken Cook from the Environmental Working Group and Chef Tom Colicchio and, and many others who you've heard from um, over the last today and yesterday, um, put together Food Policy Action, which is a scorecard on how members of Congress vote on a full range of food policy issues. So we score everything from um, domestic hunger, uh, international hunger, sustainable food and or organic farming, the environmental impact of food and agriculture, um, in order to arm consumers with this information on how their elected officials are voting uh, on, on all food issues that are important. And the, the theory of change here is that um, we will not see huge progress on food issues until we start to elect more people like Shelley. So that, that's a little bit of what we do. And wouldn't it be great to elect local officials as well at that level? Right. To have that type of a scorecard yeah. would be yeah. really great. Congresswoman, from, from inside the institution itself, um, mm -hmm. do your colleagues focus on this? Probably not as much as you would like, but are they focusing more attention on this than they have in the past? I think I think there there is a growing interest in it, and as Claire said, I mean sometimes what they need is a lot more information and education. I, I only came to Congress eight years ago, but I've been an organic farmer, worked on these issues for a very long time, and I had seen just this enormous change in this country in the marketplace, how much people are buying, how much you know everybody wants to buy local, buy organic. You know all these things have really translated to great opportunities for farmers, frankly, and for other companies. And, and when I came to Congress, there's a little bit of a kind of sharp elbow thing that happens. If you don't have seniority on an issue, you move on to something else and let the people really know it well take it over. And I was frankly shocked when I got there. You know, I had a lot of experience on health care and the environment, and I thought, well, I'll move into one of those issues and agriculture will be all taken up by somebody else. And um, I don't think I'm unique in representing what people want to hear about, but I found out that there weren't a lot of members. And it's not because many of them aren't on the right side of these issues. Many of you are represented by people who believe probably everything I believe, but they're not familiar with it. They haven't been engaged in it. And they have tended to think about agriculture as this, you know, it's just a committee where they talk about the commodities and you're either with peanuts, cotton, corn, or whoever you represent back in your home district. But frankly, urban members of all people probably hear about this more than anybody else with their constituents about worrying about food deserts or wanting to get to more farmers markets or have healthier school lunches. So um, what Claire is doing, what others are doing to become more advocates to let members of Congress know, this is an issue we want to know more about. And frankly, we'd like to vote on this issue. And part of what was missing when I first came there was people just didn't know like, we, a lot of our votes, they're obscure, they're an amendment, they're a rider and a, a appropriations bill. You don't know how to find out what everybody's doing all the time when these things come up. So, A, I was shocked to find out that there weren't more members engaged in it, but increasingly they are. They definitely hear about it back home, and they need to hear more about it and understand that this is an issue people are making decisions about today, about who they trust and who they want to represent them. Are there legislative vehicles for this beyond, say, the Farm Bill, which we're going to talk a little bit more about later? Um, where do you sort of see these things moving forward when possible? Well, check out the scorecard. I mean, we vote on these things. Sometimes they're, like I said, I, I work on agricultural appropriations, and we have a lot of, we have riders, we have funding issues, we decide where to spend your tax dollars. It comes up in the Farm Bill, international hunger issues, um, SNAP benefits, all of the frights that we have about um, making food available to people who are struggling to make ends meet and put food on the table. There, there's a lot of fights and challenges related to this. And there could be more, um, I think, if voters were expressing their desire to see more change in our food system. Allie mentioned earlier the importance of uh, getting local officials on board on this as well. Holly, could you talk a little bit about what's going on in Baltimore right now and what you guys are focused on up there? Sure. I'm Holly Freistoff, Food Policy Director for Baltimore City, uh, the first Food Policy Director for the city, and one of now 10 or so around the country. Um, it's a growing movement. So cities have an opportunity to address food access and local food issues in urban farming. 
And so really my job in the city is looking at food access, how to increase access to healthy, affordable food and food deserts um, through an intergovernmental collaboration. Food does not fit into any one government agency. And that is why food policy positions are necessary. Uh, so I work very closely with the health department, the development corporation, Baltimore Development Corporation, Office of Sustainability, Department of Planning, and now, six years later, we're working with 22 agencies in city government, looking at how does food intersect their agency. Um, so that's really the key piece. Um, some key legislation pieces that we've had is that we have a city-issued food environment map. We actually uh, make policy based on this map. We had a personal property tax credit on food desert incentive areas for bringing in new grocery stores and food deserts, and also to allow existing ones to renovate. And then we also have an urban ag tax credit that was also passed, and that's on the land, um, whereas the other one's on personal property. And that's for farmers to be able to farm um, in the city, and there's also a land leasing initiative as well. So that's a quick glimpse of city government and policy. What have you seen from other cities or states around the country that you've sort of adopted for your own? So the United States Conference of the Mayors established a food policy task force. Uh, Mayor Rawlings Blake was um, part of that task force years ago. And we have seen a growing movement of food policy directors and mayors taking on these issues. Um, as I said, there's probably 10 or 12 food policy directors from Austin, Texas, um, to, uh, to Seattle, um, and then interspersed. And what I find really interesting is that we meet monthly, actually in my calls today, um, to talk. But we all are on the same issues. But it's not like we sit down and have a strategic plan and say, let's see what our city is going to work on. We're all working on the issues that are important to our cities, and they are the same. No matter if you're a small city, big city, you know, a um, lot of vacant land, little vacant land, we still have a lot of the same issues. Allie, what are some, uh, some ways to get other communities and other states on board with this type of stuff? Yeah, I think it, um, is there is the, the real opportunity at a local level, even if you're, if you're not engaged yet, to take a small step, whether it's starting to find out who your local selectmen are, your, your town planners, and to connect with that through um, joining a board, writing a letter, showing up, <laughs> going to your capital, and saying these are important issues, as, as Congresswoman Penegree said, that you know, we want to hear from you. And if, when you go to Washington or when you go to your capital, your home state, that really sends a message to your representatives. If you don't know where to start, just start. You, know, you can be empowered if you're not in government yet, or you don't know how to make your voice heard, you can also align yourself with some of the um, national sustainable agriculture uh, organizations, say in, in DC, and follow them. That's how I learned about it. And it's a, it, food policy is an entirely new language, right? It's acronym driven. It's a little, with all due respect, a little policy geeky, <laughs> but, but it's important work. So to to hang in there and get in there, uh, maybe it's with the National Sustainable Ag Coalition or Rural Coalition or Family Farmer Coalition. You know, these, these are organizations that have support at a grassroots level uh, to help educate and to, to bring along. What's the message? You're sort of talking about how to deliver the message, but what's the message that you give to policymakers? What, how, do you, how do you sort of put this uh, in their focus when there's so much else that they have to deal with, especially? When we're talking about Congress. Well, I feel like w with what Holly said, you know, metropolitan areas are um, perhaps not in the same gridlock, and I, I uh, that that we find in Washington. Yeah. So, the message is really to place um, and to ask. You know, we we tend to want to go and say it's broken. We can fix it. But maybe if we ask instead, what do we love about our communities? What do we love about our cities and our metropolitan areas? And work more towards that. Um, that is the message. I don't know that uh, food systems are a blueprint. You know, they are to place, to history, to demographic. They're dynamic. They cross state lines. Um, and so to, to, to look at those collaborations as opposed to conflict, uh, to develop the message. And, and, you know, fresh, healthy food for everybody and access to that is a right. I mean, let's start there. Um, and who's not invited to that table and why not? and to address those types of issues at the, at the, at the ground level. Deb, Agree has, has focused on a lot of issues, trying to put um, uh, you know, a lot of things, uh, or, or try to put uh, you know, a lot of issues into the realm of, of agriculture policy, from, from nutrition to research to uh, you know, highlighting the importance of agriculture in sectors like education and immigration. Um, what are the barriers for 
sort of integrating this into all of these different areas? I think the barriers are also the opportunities. I think this business of going and working at the local community, working at Congress at levels of bringing together the different interests. You said 22 agencies. Yeah, that plus just the, the, the educational system, bringing those people together, the food industry, bringing the interest, sitting in a room, building the kind of trust to share what needs to be done around research interests, around uh, production interests, around health and nutrition and food as health interests. That's hard. It's a process. It's creating the platform to in, in engage the trust so we don't start off with animosity and admiring the problem to death, as we say, but actually building the trust to identify the different solutions and how they fit together. Because it's, it's departmentalized, if you will. We say siloed, but I try not to say that because in agriculture, silos serve, uh, they're a good technology um, to be used, but in the case of policy, not so much. So bringing people together at the local level, state and federal level, absolutely vital. Dr. Merrigan, you were, uh, like you mentioned, the first, the deputy in the first term of the Obama administration. <laughs> we're right on the cusp of a new administration. Um, how have you sort of seen the debate shift uh, over time? Are they starting with sort of a, no pun intended, but a clean plate? Are they able to um, sort of forge a new agenda on this? Or are there still issues outstanding from the Obama years that you think should be focused on as well? Oh, there's certainly things that can carry over from the Obama administration, works in progress. Yeah. Uh, but I think that there's a different political tone around these issues, and I think a number of people on the panel have said that already this morning. When we first came um, through with the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food initiative at USDA, there were a couple of votes in Congress, um, efforts to eliminate it. And now members of Congress can look at this beautiful geospatial mapping tool that USDA has called the Compass, and you'll see investments in local and regional agriculture in almost every congressional district of the country. And to your point on messaging, I have found the most effective message, besides appealing to people's personal health concerns, and everyone thinks about their own health, is about jobs. And a lot of what we're talking about has a really great job message. In particular, I think opportunities for fruit and vegetable production in this country are immense. Since 94, you see the amount of fruits and vegetables in this country really increasing in terms of imports. Uh, even fruits and vegetables that are in season in this country. That screams to me opportunity, opportunity to produce high value crops on small acreage, maybe some in urban areas, uh, certainly by the new class of beginning farmers in, that we need to repopulate our working land. So when I talk to members of Congress and I talk to policymakers, I always say this is a great economic opportunity for America. Do not let this slip away. And Holly, from the city standpoint, what can the federal government do to sort of facilitate better policy at the state and the local level? Are you looking to Congress? Are you looking to federal agencies to um, sort of do anything to help you out uh, on, like on the ground, on the front lines? So cities are a place where you can test out where policies need to be changed. <clears throat> and so in Baltimore, we have this really innovative program called the Virtual Supermarket. And it's focused in senior disabled housing sites in food deserts. And right now, um, they work with a local grocery store, ShopRite, and they have neighborhood food advocates who are seniors who run the program, and they can order online, so we actually have some tech-savvy seniors nowadays, and the food is delivered to the senior site um, where they live. Um, at this point, they have to use their SNAP benefits at the time of pickup. What does that mean to the grocery store? Grocery stores are doing all the purchasing, all the um, getting the orders together, bringing them to the seniors without any payment until pickup. So in the Farm Bill, it's written in there, and I know they're working diligently, but still working diligently, on getting online SNAP benefits to be electronic, so that you could able, be able to pay um, online. If we could do that, Baltimore would not be the only city in the nation with one grocery store doing this, too, excuse me, um, but it could be really 
looking at food deserts not just from a brick and mortar perspective. And so that's a farm bill issue. Another farm bill issue, which is very relevant to Baltimore right now, is in our food environment mapping. We have 734 convenient and corner, corner stores. Hmm. Um, we have a healthy food availability score for everyone. If the uh, depth of stock requirements um, that are proposed right now go through, it's an opportunity for our corner stores to shift to um, reduce food deserts in the city. Um, so we really do count on the farm bill um, in the implementation phase. Let's go from local to as national as we can. Uh, Claire, your group has the Play of the Union initiative. Could you sort of talk about what that is, um, what the effort behind that is as well? Yeah. Um, so about uh, 14, 15 months ago, um, Food Policy Action in collaboration with the Heal Food Alliance and the Union of Concerned Scientists started having a conversation about the next presidential election. Um, how can the food movement, how can the good food movement show up um, on a presidential cycle and start to educate candidates on um, the importance of food issues? And um, through a, you know, an interesting and good planning process, we did quantitative and qualitative research. We wanted to really dig in to find out what, on a, in a very bipartisan way, what were, the, what were the best ways to talk about food policy to politicians and to the public and to important voting demographics. And what we found, which won't be surprising, is that the overwhelming majority of Americans uh, believe that all, all people should have access to healthy, affordable food and that they're ready for the next president to take bold action on that. And that second half is really important. So not only are these things, are, is this, pol is this a, a universal value about access to healthy, affordable food, but there's a belief that the, that the government, that the president should take, to, should take some leadership on that. And so armed with that information, um, we launched Plate of the Union last October which is really, a, you know, then there's a lot of people on the stage working on really important initiatives um, directed at the president as well, including Deb. But this is really um, the first of its kind collaborative effort um, to get candidates better informed on food issues. We're doing this by opening up field offices in important battleground states in North Carolina, Iowa, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire to build leadership on the ground around these issues so that candidates are hearing firsthand um, from the public. And we're informing candidates, we're having meetings, we're, we're trying to prove the point that being good on food policy is really good politics. Um, and we're uh, launching a food truck tour at the National Republican Convention uh, in July, where we'll be traveling around to those battleground states, as well as the Democratic National Convention, um, to, to, to get attention on these issues, to get people talking about it. And um, you know, I, think, I think what's important here is that we're showing up, that this isn't, you know, this isn't the biggest effort. We're not spending $50 million. Um, but for the first time, in a really coordinated way, we're showing up at the presidential election. This is a question for anybody, but have we heard anything from the presidential candidates, from any of them on food policy at this point? I, I cover climate change a lot, and we haven't heard a lot from, from any of them on this, on this front, at least when it comes to the debates here. But in terms of food policy, are we hearing things from these, from these folks? Yeah, yeah, I mean, thank you for the shout out, Claire. But we have our presidential call to action, which really takes the five years of efforts and packages them for the presidential t talking points we hope that we'll see uh, s spoken um, sometime before November. But we've actually infiltrated the campaigns through tweeting at them and, and, and talking to them. And quite frankly, the two campaigns we've heard from uh, most recently were the Clinton campaign and the Kasich campaign. So I'm thinking if we could get those two got f folks hooked up, the governor and the secretary, gosh, we may have the radical center carved out, and, and we can we can actually <laughs> move forward with these national integrated uh, issues around our health economy and our our land, or con the conservation of our resources. So, related to the food system. So it, it's still it's still an effort, though, right? So yeah. the presidential campaigns have now come out um, with different position papers statements about what they're going to do in food and ag policy. You can Google them. You can find them. Um, but we don't hear in prime time food and ag being discussed. I watch every presidential debate. Now, I nod off every once in a while. But I pretty much, I'm pretty much attentive. And I haven't heard a moderator ask a question about food and agriculture. I haven't heard a candidate bring up food and agriculture. I heard farm worker in one debate, and it was related to immigration reform, which of course we need. Um, American agriculture is just not going to survive without um, uh, dealing with immigration issues. But otherwise, it's been silent. And I think all of us on the panel <coughs> are very heartened by this renaissance of interest 
in agriculture and food in this country, but we also know that it's not really tip top on the policy agenda. It's not where it needs to be. And as we all see from where we sit in our various roles, there's unbelievable opportunity here for policymakers. I often tell my colleagues, um, because I've focused on this issue so much, and I talk to a lot of my constituents, and I represent a somewhat balanced district. I'm the only Democrat in higher office in, in Maine. We have a Republican and Independent, so it's, it's, a, it's a mixed state, and my constituents are about a third, a third, a third, Republican, Democrat, and Independent. It's just a wide, wildly popular issue with all economic demographics, all ages. We've done some polling. Claire talked a little bit about the polling that they've done. Um, it just comes out at the top. When you ask people, would they like to buy more food locally? Would they like sustainably grown food? Would they like to support the local economy? Should everyone have access to healthy, available food? And it's even, it's interesting to me, even with my colleagues, and I say, go back and campaign on this. Use this issue. It's a good one for you. And I think just too often, um, politicians get locked into sort of the, well, we're going to talk about you know, jobs, the economy, uh, the environment, social security. We get locked into certain topics and forget that the public you know, has a whole range of things that they're interested in, and they, and they want to hear us talking about them. And it's OK to step a little bit off of the square that you know, most debates are conducted in or most conversations are conducted in. I, I want to slip in one other thing. I'm going to sneak out for votes in a minute. But um, when you were talking earlier about Baltimore and the um, the initiative around um, expanding the amount of foods available in convenience stores. So that's a proposal that's come forward from the department, the USDA, about uh, because a lot of people are in food deserts or the only place they can shop is a small corner store or a chain convenience store. So there's been a proposal that says in the four food groups you have to have at least um, seven items in each of the four food groups and one of them has to be perishable, which if you think about it isn't too complicated. And in bread and cereal that would mean you'd have to sell some fresh bread but the other six could be boxes of cereals or crackers or anything else. Fruits and vegetables, you know, every convenience store sells bananas. I don't know why, but they do. But you could have bananas, and then you could have six other things that were in the freezer or in a can. So that's already a proposal going forward. And just to talk a little bit, um, not to get too wonky here, but about how, how these things are hard to find sometimes. We had an agricultural appropriations meeting this week is where we put forward um, what the budget will look like, and that's where Congress often attaches what's called a rider, a piece of policy language that will change the intent of something in the farm bill or how we can fund, and there was a rider to say that we couldn't move forward with those rules. It's possible that the convenience stores didn't want to do this and you know, had weighed in on it, um, but the rider passed. So within our committee of about maybe 50, 60 people, we didn't have enough votes to support what seems very logical. And if we want people who, who access SNAP benefits to have access to healthier foods, and remember, this doesn't say all convenience stores have to do it. It just says a convenience store that is able to sell through the SNAP program. Now, that's your tax dollars, and they're making money off of our tax dollars. So why shouldn't we be able to say you should have to access more healthy food? But that rider one that will be attached to the agriculture appropriations bill now and maybe it will come off in the senate or maybe it will come off in conference you know these things take a long time but just to say you know these things happen in places you don't know and that's why sometimes understanding which votes we cast and who cast them can be a really critical thing i want to talk about a regulation really quick speaking of getting a little wonky here um <coughs> the waters of the u.s rule uh, from the from the uh, environmental protection agency dr merrigan could you sort of talk a little bit about um how important that is for food policy or yeah so um epa is uh, for some reason everyone's pounding on them but if you're a farmer out in california and you're dealing with drought or you're dealing in the Midwest with dwindling water supplies, um, you, you know how critical preserving our water is. Agriculture uses 70% minimum consumptive use of, of, of water uh, globally. And so um, supporting the EPA's rulemaking efforts on this seems to be appropriate. I think um, there's so many challenges around water in agriculture right now that we're really, you know, rushing to catch up with the kind of knowledge base we need to think about 2050 in a growing world population with climate change and food system refugees from small island countries who are going to be looking for new homes in a really short time. The world is changing really rapidly 
and we're still sort of stuck in the same framework thinking about our regulatory instruments. I think that the Obama administration has done a good job, but they need to, things need to carry on. Mm -hmm. Are there any other regulations from the Obama administration over the course of his term that, that any of you can point to and say, yes, that's a good policy? That's something that should continue. There, there's, yeah. I mean, there's <laughs> everything. I mean, I, I, w I worked at the Clinton administration, and you know, the last day I was in office, which I imagine was January 19th, 2001, I was putting staff in cabs going to the Federal Register with regulations. Mm -hmm. I mean, government is doing regulations all the time. Here's just one example. Um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture came out with a proposed rule a couple weeks ago on humane care standards for organic production. Well, I'd like to see that finish, get across the finish line before the end of this, this uh, presidential term. But that's just one in many. There's, it, I think a lot of people understand Congress, or you know, how a bill becomes a law. There's that little ditty on the public um, television that we watch as kids. And when I was a professor, I'd ask my students, how many of you have ever written an email or a letter to Congress? And all my university students' hands would go up, and I'd say, well, how many of you have actually sent a letter or an email to a rulemaking docket? And they all looked at me like, what? Mm -hmm. And the point of the matter is, when we're legislating, um, it, Congresswoman Pingree's bill, I hope, passes. That should cross the finish line this year, even this short legislative year. I have great hopes with the waste um, uh, the food waste issue, but then the devil's in the details. All of the stuff she's talking about is going to require regulations um, or detailed educational programs and that sort of thing. And if we fail to follow through as constituents of these issues to see them all the way to the finish line, sometimes things get uh, twisted in the regulatory process. We have about 20 minutes left. I'll open it up to audience questions now, if there's anybody who wants to add anything. Uh, I, can, I got some glare, so I think there are people walking through the hallways or the, the side with uh, microphones. So if you want to flag one of them down. Thank you. Sorry about that. No problem. We'll, we'll go uh, right over here first, since there appears to be a mic going that way. Sorry, guys. Um, Gabrielle Ludwig, oh, Almond you. Board of California. And since this group prides itself in, in, in wanting to hear the range of issues. Actually, I actually have two questions for the committee. So one is just simply, how are you going to bring growers along? This whole conversation has been about consumers, industry, Congress. But we heard yesterday from Vilsack, it's because of all the growers in this country that most of us don't spend our time growing and worrying about food. So in this conversation, where do you bring your normal grower? into the, along in, in this conversation. I have another question. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll go ahead and take a, a first shot here. The AGREE initiative was set up at the very outset to bring in farmers and ranchers into the dialogue. So the, the work you see on our website and that I discuss really is, I, I didn't make this up. This was driven by a consensus dialogue that included very strong agriculture voices, corn, soy, organic, small, large, uh, very diverse operations, ranching, fruits and vegetables, uh, and grains. And, and w in our work, you'll, you'll see the, th those voices and, and positions. Um, and I think the, it's important, though, to, to include the growers and the people that are out on the hundreds of millions of acres out there, because we really want them to be part of the change. They have to be part of the dialogue. So. Um, I just want to let you know that we did include them, but, but just us alone, that, that's not going to work. We need all of us, Baltimore and, and play to the nation and the way we communicate, what, um, you know, we need, we need all. Support. And then my other question, this relates to food waste, and I'm just curious, for those of you who have been working on the food waste issues, which is a really important issue, and I think, you know, the policies that are talked about will address what I'll call the, or I heard someone yesterday call the low-hanging fruit. But where do pesticides fit in to that whole conversation? Because they prevent damage in the field. They help us keep food fresh till it can be consumed. So I'm just curious where that part of it has been in any of your conversations. I don't want to be the only one answering the question here. That's important. I guess yeah. I'm, I'm struggling, Gabrielle, to figure out what you're looking for. I mean, certainly pesticides and fertilizers are used by um, farmers in this country. 
Um, and even organic farmers uh, have a list of allowable um, natural pesticides in many cases that they can use. Of course, it's something in the toolbox. I think um, if you're not hearing a lot about farmers on this panel, I think part of our objectives here is how do we open the doors wider and have more inclusive conversations? You know, one of my concerns has always been that you know, when I first came into USDA in this last cycle, there was a lot of talk about Wall Street, the 99% versus the 1% in terms of, of that whole uh, discussion with the financial collapse. For me, the 99, 1% is those people who are on the farms and ranches and the vast majority of us who have very little connection to American agriculture anymore, very low literacy about how food is grown, who grows it, why it's important. And so, we really need to uh, have ag and food be a priority, not just for farmers and ranchers and uh, food processors and the food industry, but you know, every person in this country needs to understand the value and the importance and the threats that our country face if we don't repopulate our working lands with young people if we don't continue on protecting our environmental resources to your question about EPA's regulation, if we're not really um, investing in research to tackle very important challenges that farmers, and I, frankly, I have worked in farm policy my entire career. I'm not brave enough to be a farmer. They take on incredible risks incredible risk and I'm totally in admiration and grateful for every farmer I've ever met even when we don't break bread on all the issues because I think that they're they're really noble and they're interesting and they're um, they're doing important work but what we want is we want a more robust uh, conversation we want everyone to care about this issue in the same way as those farmers and ranchers do every day I think we have a question over here Hi, I'm Bill Bowling from Atlanta. Um, I first want to applaud, we've had two panels and a dozen people address food waste for education, for policy. I'm sorry, the congressperson had to leave. So I'm so encouraged. As a person who helped start food banking 35 years ago and have been working in Atlanta, I'm working in the urban ag space now, but it seems interesting to me that we've had a dozen people talk about food waste and you've never mentioned food banks. <laughs> you never mentioned Feeding America. I mean, I handled 15 million pounds of fresh produce. We've worked with the farmers to pay pick and pack costs to make them whole so that we could get it. We do need to do education, but the issue is capacity, uh, you know, to, to get it out of the field and get it to the consumer. So I, I just wonder where we fit. It feels like a silo that is not acknowledging a movement that already exists who wants to ally with others and certainly young entrepreneurs coming into the work. I think it's a good, I mean, it's a good point and in a lot of ways it was an assumption that, um, that food banks and certainly Feeding America are a huge part of the conversation, whether it be meetings on the Hill or part of the refed roadmap on reducing food waste or, or, or coalition work, they are absolutely at the table uh, and central to the, the really important hunger component um, to reducing food waste. It's a huge part of the conversation and if it hasn't been mentioned, it's um, only because I think we all assumed that it, that it was part of the, the conversation. Well, I, I don't think you should assume that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I agree. And food, uh, Feeding America was a very active is an active member of the AGREE initiative, and you're absolutely right, my bad. I, when we were talking about food waste at the beginning, I, I wanted to say, and the business of, of, of the Feeding America, the food banks, the, the, the food assistance programs are, are vital, so. Five Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, and, and it's a key to making sure this, the product's used. Yeah, and I think also getting food that may remain in the fields that's completely edible by, via gleaning programs is a terrific way uh, to, to minimize that type of waste and connect to community to also support um, feeding those food insecure within community. Any, any other questions? 
Yeah, Don really, Ratner, oh. um, my question would have gone to the Congresswoman, so I'll just ask somebody else to pick up on the answer. But she said in the home battles, um, the people who were saying that the um, sell-by dates, explode-by dates, whatever you want to call them, um, were going to lose. Um, sort of in a PSA way, I'm disagreeing um, when it comes to meats. And those of us who have been in the meat industry, um, there's a whole lot of science behind um, the dates we put on things, and we can't afford to recall, we can't afford to poison our customers, and, you know, would ask that people sort of respect those for health reasons, and, you know, is there agreement that there are really some of these that people really for their own health need to acknowledge? I mean, so I listened really carefully to the Congresswoman's um, talk, and I believe she really did a carve out in terms of items that would present food safety risks where there would be uh, a, a, the problem is she's saying it's kind of muddled right now it's a mix of things that it's a meaningless date and other things where it's uh, exigent it has to happen and we need clarity and um, consistency in that sort of labeling which what she's calling for so I don't think if if Congresswoman Pingree was here, she'd disagree at all with you. Yes, I agree, but currently where Easter said before, there are some that currently really should not be for safety reasons. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is where you can connect to the gentleman behind you from Atlanta, you know, in terms of how to get your product into the mouths of people that could, could utilize the protein, you know, in this in the distribution system. Other questions? Yes, we have a couple of questions from our Twitter account. If you have questions and you'd rather send them on social media, use hashtag food tank. Mm -hmm. This one's from Jessica Carbone. And she asks, do you think there's more change being accomplished by food activists outside of government roles than inside? Allie, what should well, do? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that you know, one of the questions I get asked is, what is a food activist? And what, what I like to say is, when you eat, whatever you eat, you are choosing a food system with that food and with the ingredients in that food. So voting with your fork really can take on more meaning as we get into the ingredients and at the same time it can also cause you know, paralysis if you start to look at everything from uh, what's inside a chocolate chip cookie, for example. Um, but looking at, I think, the value chain of the, the values of what uh, types of not just nutrition, but also how are workers treated, how is the, how is the environmental impact of this work, farmers and fishermen. I'd like to put in a pitch here for fishermen uh, being included in this discussion about food, um, because it is seafood, right? <laughs> so, uh, so I believe that, yes, local food activism is, a, is part of the sea, sea change, as I said at the beginning of the, of the hour. Um, I think farm to school programming is a fabulous way to reach many, many people about good food education and that that is gonna, uh, we are already growing uh, engaged citizenry there. So working locally is in a very important way. I think it's both a top down, what would we do like this kind of a thing, um, both the federal government, but we can't wait, the cavalry's not coming. We need to work locally. We need to work in the metropolitan areas, uh, wherever you are, whether it's suburban, rural, or urban. I'll just add to that. Yes. I have, um, this is a statement I've made throughout my entire career, wherever I've been living. Innovation doesn't start in Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it doesn't. I'm looking for all the different innovators and, um, you know, the real great grassroots experiments that are going around on it, across the countryside and going back to that Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food Compass map that you can access on USDA's website. Part of the goal there, too, was for people to hit all those dots on the map around the country and say, oh, look what they're doing over there in Hawaii, where we'd like to visit, of course. What are they doing in Iowa? And what are they doing in Florida? And for people to network, to, uh, to be very entrepreneurial and activist and innovative. And when things get ripe, when they get mature, when they become understood in a greater way, then Washington steps in and they do regulations or they do legislation or they put pots of money um, to certain goals. But the pilots, those are out in the countryside. So the, the Twitterverse is right in this. Mm -hmm. 
And I just want to say, you know, the, the regulations is such a big piece of this at a local level. Uh, you know, many of the food regulations that, that have been written are, are addressing a large food system. So when we look at you know, slaughterhouses, for example, or regulatory um, barriers to food, local food entrepreneurs, working to change those regulations with food safety, always in mind, with transparency in mind, is, is uh, is not sexy work, but it's very important work to put, put to um, really support these local and regional food systems and economies. We need to look at regulations on the ground. I think as much as we've lost contact with where our food comes from, we've also lost generations and information of how do we support regulatory infrastructure and physical infrastructure to support these local and regional food systems. We have another question. I'll get my microphone back there, but okay. Holly, this is a question for you. Um, could you speak a little bit to the connections you're making with those local <coughs> bodega convenience store owners and the local growers and ultimately the people that you work with? Sure. So the health department has a healthy corner store program where they're working with corner stores to get healthy food. Um, it's a national movement. We're seeing more and more healthy corner stores. Um, but there's a challenge there that without a national policy that would help to facilitate a distribution chain and be able to make it scalable. So we see these great corner stores all across the country, but it's just a small percentage of the total. Um, so this policy did have an opportunity to potentially make that shift so that it wouldn't just be on a program, but it would be able to scale it up so that we could be able to see. There's a, this myth that right now corner stores in Baltimore and probably everywhere else, it's a place for snacks. It's not a place for food shopping, um, but you can use your SNAP benefit. So if you have a comprehensive policy or strategy that is slowly shifting them from just snacks to being able to buy the center of your plate for dinner at an affordable rate. So it's not just adding a few bananas and apples. But in San Francisco, I had the opportunity to go to this amazing healthy corner store, and it was their meat department. They had the most amazing meat. And because they sold meat in their corner store, everyone was buying produce and grains to be able to buy dinner. And that is where you really look at the diversity and think, oh, meat and healthy food. But yes, you need to be able to go to a store and buy your dinner. Um, and in food deserts where you can't get to a supermarket as often as you wish, um, corner stores could provide that opportunity. So I think that there's a policy place and also a program place. A question right in front. Uh, you don't have a mic, so go ahead and... That's all right. I can speak loudly. I'm Garrett, um, professor at American University School of National Service. I'm so grateful, all-female panel, very inspired. <laughs> I wanted to ask a question about the larger context of the political economy and the unprecedented level of corporate con consolidation in the agribusiness sector and the mergers that have been happening, the mega-mergers in the feed and the meat and the disproportionate influence of um, industry, private industry, in the public legislation process and products. Antitrust, monopoly, these larger issues. Kevin. Okay, everyone's looking at me. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so interestingly, there have been different, um, the congresswoman talked about riders on appropriations bills. <coughs> and there has been a lot of action in the appropriations committees around halting uh, different antitrust efforts in agriculture as it pertains to an agency of USDA called GIPSA. And don't even ask me what to um, say what that acronym stands for. The Grain Inspectors. Inspection and Packard and Stockyards Stock Act Administration. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so anyhow, GIPSA. And this time round, I think that that, that didn't um, stay in the bill. So I think that um, this is not just a food activist concern, but it is something that I hear in a lot of different walks of life in American agriculture, concerns about just the health of the economy, competition. Um, Food Tank asked some of us questions ahead of time. They said, what's different now, and what are you concerned about than what you're, when your parents were, you know, your grandparents were of your age? And for me, it's now a global, globalized food system. So all the, all the issues that we're dealing with are so much more complex. And they're on the minds of a lot of different people, um, a very diverse group of people. So that's not a full answer. But I just w want to say it's, it's not um, 
the, the conversation is becoming more interesting. It's not just a black and white conversation anymore in terms of, no, you can't go there. Um, so I, I think there are members of Congress, a broader group that are talking about it. Yeah, I would just quickly add, you've got the, you know, the whole economic system, whether it's airlines or, or tech industry or energy, and direct foreign investment in the United States as well, consolidating at least in food and agriculture, as you mentioned, you know, chemicals, seeds, and, and meat. Um, I think they're worrisome for a lot of people in the supply chain, those that buy products from those companies and those that sell into those, you know, so there's a lot of, there's interest. I, I, we did not have any recommendations around that, but there is lots to be interested in and follow. Um, so you can help teach that as you are instructing your students on the subject. It's important. I think that's all we have time for. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much.